think I was originally approached by Jonathan Powell, who was producing the project, and we agreed immediately that if we could get Guinness, that would be the thing. I, I can't remember whether I suggested or he did, or we just came up with the one name straight away. Um, the problem was that Alec had never done television, and uh, he was enormously distinguished, and we, we felt diffident. And in the end, I agreed to write to him. And Alec wrote straight back, and he had, I'm sure you've seen his handwriting, but it went from kind of uh, northwest to southeast across the page, beautifully written, uh, saying that he'd always liked Smiley and was interested in the part. And then, as far as I remember, we all met for lunch, including Arthur Hopcraft, who was going to do the adaptation. And gradually it, it fitted, and then he met John Irvin. I don't think I was present for that, but he was uh, terribly taken with John. I was approached by Jonathan Powell and the writer um, Arthur Hopcraft. Uh, uh, the BBC had acquired the rights, and I know that Jonathan was working with Arthur. And uh, I was a, a, a late arrival. They were in, um, obviously, uh, John Le Carre, David Cornwall, uh, had some say in the choice of director. Uh, I had worked with Arthur successfully, I think, um, in three previous years, and we made The Nearly Man together and Hard Times. And Jonathan was the uh, producer of the series, um, The Nearly Man. So we knew each other, and we trusted each other, and we liked each other and we were relatively successful. So I obviously was very, very um, keen to be uh, asked, and um, one day they, the three of them invited me to lunch and said, what about it? As always, the first question was, who do you think could play Smiley? And I mentioned a couple of names, um, and they remained stony-faced. And David said, Never thought about, well, how about Alec Guinness? Uh, and I thought, well, that's a, oh, I mean, that's a brilliant idea. But uh, I was very, very skeptical about his, um, his willingness to, to, you know, to do television and also to commit himself uh, for what was going to be a year's, a year's work. Um, so while I was... Uh, thrilled at the prospect. It did seem a bit fantastical to me. Um, anyway, we, we, we set out. Uh, luckily, uh, they, had, uh, uh, they had met before, uh, uh, Le, Le Carre and Alec, and there was a, a lot of mutual admiration and respect. Um, so that, 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 that helped a lot. Uh, I was then set out to woo him because he was showing a lot of reluctance. He was very, very reluctant to commit. Uh, and I embarked on a, on, a, on a courtship. I set out to bring him to the altar. And it took, I think, three lunches. In those days, the BBC was the largest film production company in the world. We didn't talk about vulgar things like budgets. And the moment we had Alec, we could empty the National Theatre. It was extraordinary. And anyway, he gave a kind of informal yes, and I was desperate to get the contract out of him, but it wasn't my job to do so. And then he rang me up. Uh, I really feel I would like to be on the Atlantic. And this was a pretty... <laughs> disingenuous statement because he knew perfectly well that I lived down in Cornwall on a house on the Atlantic. And so I, I said, well, come down and use our house and uh, we'll settle you in and move out because then we come back to London. And so he came down and we spent a couple of days together uh, in the house and then Jane and I moved out and he stayed there. And uh, it was by then clear that he was going to play the part, and he was working himself into it. And, and he was doing all the things that I now know Alec does, that, so that uh, he, he was looking for the identity of a spy. He was looking, he was looking for the shell he could crawl into. Uh, he, he was a secretive man. He, he, he was always considering the possibilities of his own identity. He was, in a sense, extracting, spying upon, and, and, and living off 
all the people around him and the environment around him. And in that sense, he was the secret center of everything in his own perception. Uh, like, like many artists, like many writers, he saw himself as, as, one of, as a social thief, really. And that fitted perfectly into the mentality of a spy. I had a, I mean, the moment I saw his wig, I realized he'd pinched my hairstyle. And I had a sort of habit then of, of uh, a sort of boyish habit of shoving my knuckle across my brow. And I found Alec doing that. And then uh, Jane and I went down to a house he was living in in Chelsea and watched him trying on spectacles that he had from Curry and Paxton, a whole tray of spectacles. Now, do you think I'm that? No, I'm not. No, but I could be that. And then he'd be so... And that went on. It was an enchantment to watch him. And, of course, he loved being watched, too, and, and, and he was getting a reflection as, as we were going along. And... Then he called me up, who was used to call up at about six o'clock, often to propose dinner if he was lonely, at the Cornwall. But this, may I speak to Mr. David Cornwall, please, he'd say. I'd say, hello, Alec, how did you know it was me? He'd say. And, and uh, so this time he said, I've never met a real spy, and I would really like to meet a real spy. So I rang Sir Maurice Oldfield, who had been C, head of SIS, and I didn't know it at the time, but was under a tragic personal shadow. There was later a minor scandal about him and so on. But uh, Maurice was very pleased and very excited, and we all met for lunch. Now, we didn't just meet for lunch. Alec appointed the restaurant, and when I arrived, I said... Uh, did Sir Alec in his book, and the waiter went, shh, shh, shh. And to my astonishment, led me all through the restaurant to a back room where Alec, for security reasons, had decided that we would sit alone. <laughs> so by the time I reached it, every head in the restaurant turned. Our cover was blown, whatever our cover was. And he and Morris then sat and talked together. The two knights clashed armour. And quickly came to the conclusion that I was slightly out of court. And Morris had a slight North Country accent. I, I think young David has, has really got a bit over the top with all this spying stuff. Alec, oh, I do agree, says Alec. And he sort of joined the Secret Service by then. And so I kept a low profile through lunch, and suddenly Morris said, I'm going. Thank you very much. It's been very interesting. I want to go. And he got up abruptly, little tubby man with spectacles. He was never the model for Smiley. I didn't meet him till after I'd invented Smiley, but the press wouldn't wear that and always said he was the model for Smiley. He got up and went down the road away, walked away, swinging his umbrella. Alec and I, I followed Alec out onto the street and Alec watched Morris going down the street. And now, can we have a little brandy and talk about that? So we go back to the table and... He says, now, first of all, there's very vulgar cufflinks. To all spies where there's cufflinks. And I said, I don't think so. I think Maurice just has a broad taste in cufflinks. And those dreadful orange boots, he said. And I said, well, I don't think that's just Maurice's taste in orange boots. They were sort of suede boots. And they were quite, quite noisy. And then he said, now, tell me this. And he, he picked up his own water glass. And he said... Now, I've seen people doing that pensively. I've seen people doing that. But I've never seen people doing that before. Do you think he's looking for the dregs of poison? And it was a self-enchantment that he was engaging in. It was a complete personality substitution under control, a controlled schizophrenia that he was undertaking. And on the... We were shooting almost, or uh, John Irving was shooting almost in sequence, so that wonderfully the last big shoot was the discovery of the mole in the house beside the canal. And Jane and I went down just to watch the last night, otherwise we didn't want shooting. We didn't, I didn't watch shooting, he didn't want me around, didn't like me around. Um, and by that time he and John Irving were absolutely an item, artistically speaking. They were working wonderfully together and I was just a uh, completely spare in that relationship, and rightly so. And Alec was in his long johns in the house on the canal, 
and he was making friends with the pistol that he was going to be holding, as actors do with a property, really getting it into his hand and, and making it his own. And he was speculating, really speculating, about who it would be. Now, who do you think it is? Could it be that, I do hope it's not that dear Bill Hayden, and so on. And we were going through the different characters. Now, he knew everybody's line better than everybody knew it, but that made no difference. The Alec who was going to be Smiley did not know who the mole was, though he had a pretty shrewd idea. And I, I loved, and I continue to love, that the child in him that was able to stay alive, he was by then in his 70s, I think, I can't remember, I mean, or perhaps late 60s anyway, but it was the, the wonder in him uh, about story that never died, uh, and part of his insecurity, part of his restlessness, was that ever-wakeful child that needed to be enchanted or needed to take center stage and pacify the hostile adults around him. And to watch the child at work alongside the professional, which was the other part of Alec, was a huge enchantment for me, a master class. Alec, had the, the, the perfect role for him in Smiley because he, 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 he listens, he reflects, he reacts. And as, as you know, he always said, reacting is, is, is the best acting, and that's and therefore I've been fair. I'm a very good reactor. Um, and it was, it was quite interesting seeing England's finest actors show up and you know, do their stuff in, 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 very diff in so many different you know, ways. It's rather like I used to think about, I used to watch them at rehearsal. And um, they'd come in, roll up their sleeves, and it was like net practice. With Alec, you know, Josh coming bold at him, and then, <laughs> and, so, and, and, and you know, it was an intriguing process seeing so many distinguished actors, you know, working in, in, in for the same, you know, in, 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 in the same, in the same story but um, coming at it from so many different directions. Dear Alec was, uh, was always anxious about how he looked. He, didn't, he never felt that he was round enough. Um, it, give, it did give him license over to, you know, to drink quite a lot of Guinness. But after four weeks, I think he was bored by the Guinness and it was having absolutely no effect on his weight. He gave up. Um, but he was, he did feel the shape of Smiley was important because there are so many you know, allusions to his, the look of him, his silhouette in, in, in the book. Um, he, did, he, was, he was very, very um, insecure about it. So insecure uh, that I think we'd been shooting for three weeks when he rang me at three o'clock in the morning, two hours prior to shooting on Primrose Hill, saying, John, I think we could save a lot of money if you recast me. Please, um, I haven't, I haven't found, I haven't found George. I don't know where he is. I haven't found him. And no matter how much Guinness I drink, <laughs> he's trying to make a joke of it. Um, I, why don't you get Arthur Lowe? He's the right shape. Get out there. Arthur, I'm sure, would do a wonderful job. Please, recast me, save yourself the trouble, save me the pain and the humiliation. Please, recast. And I said, now look, um, I've seen the rushes and um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a reviewer. It's, 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 it's so truthful. It is, you have absolutely nothing to worry about. It's, 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 a, it's a remarkable, remarkable portrayal. I think his, his embodiment of Smiley became definitive. And as a, um, David, when he was writing Smiley's People, having seen the selection of Rushes, the, f the, the 40 minutes that we gave him to reassure him um, that we hadn't taken any liberties, um, went, you know, went back to the draft of Smiley's People and re started rewriting him. 